Crafts Tech Club, a first <laughs> short story writing project featuring me. Now, um, I took last week off and I want to thank you for understanding. You know, sometimes we just need to take a break. Um, I was and still am going to write a few more stories before taking a few months off to work on some other stuff. Um, but uh, the last story I wrote was a fantasy story, and I really enjoyed writing it. I love the characters. I got uh, some feedback on it that was really encouraging. I'm so happy there are people out there that are uh, connecting and finding, uh, you know, characters that they can appreciate in these stories. Um, it, it just feels real good. Uh, today's story, I was tasked to do horror, and I didn't quite reach, like, total horror, but I, I kind of reached that, uh, you know, like, is it magic, is it monsters kind of thing, um, and it, it's more about one person and how they interact with the world, how they deal with, uh, you know, a past relationship, how they're trying to work through all of that with, you know, their their art in a very similar way to me. Um, I do think I pulled some stuff from my real life into this story, um, more so, uh, uh, more plainly, I guess I should say, than I do a lot of the others. Um, but none of the characters are representative of anybody I specifically know. And none of these situations are supposed to represent or reflect any specific, uh, you know, thing that's happened in my life. Um, you know, out they're, they're just inspirations that happen when you write. And when you write in, in this kind of one sitting, <clears throat> no revising kind of method, you know, sometimes you just kind of pour out... Um, you know, stuff that you're not really aware that you're doing, that you may catch, um, you know, when you read it, like I'm about to. I just remember some of it uh, as I was finishing. I'm like, oh my goodness, somebody might, you know, this this kind of reminds me of this. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I know you're going to like it. Um, now, before we go into that, I just want to get into some self-promotion because I don't have a sponsor for the show. I only have myself. Um, if you want to sponsor my show, you know, go for it. You know, <laughs> help help pay for that ad, uh, 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 you know, space uh, so I can get my numbers up and stuff. I don't know. Um, but... I have a couple of things that I have going on for sale for you to purchase. Um, I have some coloring books. They are called Mindful and Funky, uh, all designed by a lovely person I know, Athens Cascade. I edited them, compiled them, and everything. Um, they each have uh, different, um, like, nearly full page, like there's some borders, um, Intricate designs, uh, very mandala, mandala. How do you how do you pronounce that? I don't know. Um, the one I'm showing on screen now is book three, and it's all based on five pointed stars. Um, and uh, I really like this book. I need to get another copy for myself to color, or I might just show you me the the ones that I color. Who knows? Um, I'm waiting for the trans one, but I also have a non-binary journal using the monotile specter. Um, and then the inside, it's uh, dots, and it has date, day of the week, and time on top. And it's a larger format, so it's good for school and, uh, you know, sketching and all sorts of stuff. Um, and you can find links for those below. And I also have... Uh, online stores uh, designed by humans, uh, Redbubble and Zazzle. They all offer um, uh, different types of products. They, of course, they all offer t-shirts, um, but the, the, the types of t-shirts are different in each, uh, uh, each store. And some people prefer to shop from one or the other. So if like, you're looking for a t-shirt, um, 
I think Redbubble has more of them. Redbubble has all of the show cards for first drafts that glow, all the ones that were suitable for that. Um, Zazzle has uh, things like speakers and um, uh, uh, like glass acrylic or something uh, coasters, which I think is really cool. Um, also car mats. <laughs> I'm just like, sure. Um, and then Designed by Humans has uh, some uh, metallic water bottles, uh, you know, the, the silver aluminum uh, water bottles. And right now, some of my um, digital art is all that's on Designed by Humans and uh, some logo stuff. But I'm slowly working on filling that one up. Um, they they have different requirements for images. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, why, why are you guys being silly? But uh, I actually had to apply with a, a you know portfolio for Design by Humans, and, and I kind of appreciate that. So I'm going to make sure I curate a, a proper um, uh, catalog on that site. But do check them out on uh, Nails That Glow on all those sites, links below. And don't forget to visit my nightly blog on nailsthatglow.com and also the information for this show, other shows, Abstractions That Glow, my shops, everything else is on nailsthatglow.com. And uh, yeah, like and subscribe, tell your friends. So we're going to go ahead and get into the story right now. Um, like I said, this one uh, started out as horror, and I do want to warn you, um, there are some challenging subjects in this story. Um, nothing, uh, nothing I'd say is R-rated. There's a suggestion of uh, sex that happens, um, and there's, uh, uh, like, relationship abuse and, uh, like, homicide, violent homicide. So, you know, if you're, if you're not into that, <clears throat> excuse me, goodness, if you're not into that, if you, if you're not, uh, prepared to listen to that today, you know, I understand. Um, I don't have any water. <clears throat> Let's hope I can make it because getting to the kitchen right now, because it's on the other side of my screen here, it's not going to happen. All right. So we're going to read a story today because that is why we're here. And I'm thinking I'm going to make a shirt that says this is why we're here because it is. This is why we're here. I, s I believe I say that every episode. <laughs> um, and, you know, this, uh, if I could figure out how to turn this into a shirt. <laughs> uh, anyways. All right. Here we go. You ready? All right. Here we go. This is Picture of Fences. A first draft that glow story by me, Avon. A mixture of paint thinner and warm sunlight wake Ron up. Slowly searching the workspace for the open container, he hears the cat exclaim innocence as a jar or uh, a jar a jar of paintbrushes falls to the ground. Inspecting the floor for all the brushes, he finds the spilled thinner. A few panels of a discarded project soaked up most of the thinner before it could get too far. He sort of liked it. He sort of... <laughs> the errors are beginning already. He sort of liked the effect. Might touch this up and sell it, he muses to himself. Setting the kettle and prepping the coffee in front of the massive window was the highlight of waking up. The forest, the mountains in the distance, the way the light played with the lake, and how that light came through the trees. It was all enough to make his heart sing. Even the brisk air in the summer and winter weather was eternally sweet and fresh. Only the smell of coffee and honey under his nose as he watched the light climb the sky was added to make it all perfect. He checked his phone. A depressing number of voice messages, texts, and emails were listed on the computer screen. 
None of that matters right now, he whispers to himself. He sets an alarm to ring in nine hours. Checking the messages when he ate tonight was a better plan. He must finish this painting first. Walking up to a canvas a few feet taller than himself and wider than that by a few feet, he looks thoughtfully at each detail. Checking the photographs his assistant took on the side before inspecting his work again. After twenty or so minutes of this, he wheels up his supply station. A custom-built cabinet was stored for gallons of paints, thinners, and hundreds of brushes. A surface designed, res <laughs> surface designed with reservoirs for paint and built-in brush holders and an array of lights on flexible arms. His assistant said it looked like a makeup booth with no mirror and a wider table. He just wanted to have everything at hand when he was working. Started out as a basket and became this mobile station taller than he was with the lights on top. It even had space to hang a folding stool on one side so he could sit when he needed. Something his assistant added before leaving to photograph in New Zealand. The painting he was working on was inspired by something his mom said to him after his divorce. We all build a fence to protect our yard, but we never want to make them without doors. He thought he knew what she was saying. Her way of thinking was unique to her. Being autistic kept her from saying things plainly. It never was an issue as she was an artist herself and people just thought of her as quirky. A frustrating thing for Ron. He started to think she might be neuro he started to think he might be neurodivergent as well. And the doctors agreed. Did not change much. It was just less stressful for Ron now he knew about himself. And uh, sorry, this sentence is messed up. Uh, did not change much in his life. Just made life less stressful. He was also comforted in knowing that his mom wasn't suffering from some kind of dementia or something even worse. She would say things often that wouldn't, you know, I don't know what I was writing there, but whatever. He loves his mom. They're both autistic, probably. She would say things that would often inspire a painting for Ron. A fence with a door, he muttered. The painting had an American suburban house on the other side of a simple fence with, a tri with triangular tops and natural wood texture. The fence had small gaps between each picket and the rail on top and bottom a similar thickness to the posts. The hinges to the door attached to the post on the far right, the latch attached to another post set closer than the others to make the door a typical size. The handle and other metal parts were all glossy black with brass-colored screws. The house on the other side was still uncolored. The space for the sky had small marks for clouds and possible locations for the sun. Ron was proud of the wood texture. The pictures his assistant took of fences in three states of the USA, 100 homes with fences built in the 1950s with no paint. Many had been stained, but it was the grain and texture Ron needed. The subtle ways the light would catch the minor imperfections and how different wood would age. How drastically the look of the wood changed from morning to evening. Over 700 pictures scattered over the wall, the floor, and some hanging from the lights on his workstation. Two months working on hand painting the wood texture on each picket giving each one its own personality, the posts and the rails having entire, entirely unique properties to the rest of the fence and the door being made to look warmer. At least he thought so. He checked the paint with his fingers, lightly at first, then with more force. Everything was dry enough, he thought. He was going to do something his art contemporaries and instructors would have rolled their eyes and been very critical of. He used painter's tape to leave only the small gaps between each pickets exposed. The area of the house above the fence and the sky were all left exposed. Ron was happy with the precise application. 
The ivory white paper covering the fence took it out of his vision enough to focus on the house and the sky. Nearly a clean canvas. In essence, for him to start painting. After the sun started falling behind the horizon, Ron spooned soup into his mouth without looking. The screen of his tablet was filled with messages. Dozens of emails from people wanting to commission him and galleries wanting to have access to ten or more of his paintings. Even a few museums wished to add him to the modern collections as part of their pride displays. Why not ask some of the women or trans painters, he says to nobody. He replies to a few of the museums suggesting they ask some spe specific painters and sculptors, and if they were displayed, he would be happy to offer a few works and an endorsement. Stupid politics. He laughs into a spoon, spraying soup onto the table. The transcriptions of his voice messages were never perfect when your friends had accents thicker than hot glue. I want you to call ma hen u kunt. His friend Drew learned enough English after growing up speaking French and Russian his entire life. How he said some words made the AI transcribe some interesting things. He scribbled down a few notes to call and write some messages that were more thoughtful when he was done painting. The e-paper would send the notes to his assistant and all of it would be added to the calendar. Ron loved how simple things were without needing someone keeping track of things right next to him. He needed to be alone to work. That night, Ron slept on the balcony. The stars were present. The air was cool and sweet. He wanted to... He, he wanted... He wanted... <laughs> this is why we're here. I didn't put a few words in this next sentence. Kind of like the sentences with his mom and autism. I don't know. He wanted to fall asleep to the sound of trees and owls. Yeah. <laughs> the lush yoga mat and microfiber blankets offering enough physical comfort as he laid down. A few last bites of an apple before pitching it over to the earth below. Then he slept. Ron loved his dreams. They were often how he imagined his paintings. He would imagine details and colors that might make for a good canvas. Sometimes it did not work. His mind was always trying out things. The things he could remember when he woke, he often tried. Tonight, he dreamt of the fence, the house, the sky of his current work. He was standing before the fence, looking at the house that was filled with color and dimension. He couldn't quite make out the color. It eluded him each time he the it eluded him each time his focus went to it through the small gaps in the pickets. The sky was a mix of baby blue and pale icy blue. There were heavy feeling cotton clouds filled with filled with the light of the sun shining from somewhere behind the thickest part of the largest clouds. He decided to sit and sip on hot tea while he took in the view. The beach chair behind him ready with a teapot and a cup on a really small stone table. All of it just the right position to look at the fence as if it were his painting. He takes a lemon slice from a small saucer laying on top of the tea in his mug before taking a sip. The vibrant mix of lemon with the gentle flavor of the black tea made him hum in satisfaction. The sun was moving through the sky, showing different textures in the fence and in the corner of his vision on the house behind the fence. Each time his focus went to the house, it became impossible to see properly. He wanted to see the house. He wanted to get a good look at it. He knew it was in his mind somewhere. What it was supposed to look like the color, the texture. He knew it was there. What he was supposed to do, what he was supposed to make it look like. He finishes the tea he is sipping on in a swig, clears his throat, throwing his legs to either side of the beach chair. Before standing, wait, that sentence was awkward. <laughs> 
throwing his legs to either side of the beach chair before standing. He swaggers his way to the door on the fence, appreciates the latch and the handle, the way the brass seemed to glow, the glossy blackness of the metal. He reaches out to put his thumb on the switch as he wraps his fingers around the handle and starts to gently pull. Nothing happens. The latch button moves, but there's no movement in the door. He tries a few more times before taking a step back. He looks to the chair he was sitting in, still there, welcoming him back with its silent comfort. The rest of the fence serene and perfect, the landscape just past it still unable to be focused on. Moving, to the, stone, moving the stone table to the fence, he gets on top of it to look over the fence. The top of the fence is a level where his head stops moving. A loud knock sound, as if his head were wood, rings through his ears. Reaching up, he feels nothing. He can raise his hands above the fence line. Trying to bring his head above it is again met with a barrier of some kind. Looking around the small, nondescript yard, he sees nothing but perfect grass. The only developed details are the fence and the chair. Okay, Ronald. Try the door again telling himself, looking slightly down. In his mind, he pictures the door opening. He pictures how the latch works, every single latch and hinge and screw he has in his workshop and how they all felt, reflected light, and worked, recalling the measurements he had taken of many of them. Thickness, the thickness of the paint, the kind of paint or enamel firmly recalling every small door and the variations of wood and install methods used. The week it took him to build a fence that would, with, that would not withstand a child laughing at it just to get a feeling for them. Then he grabbed the handle, setting his thumb on the latch again, and pulled. As it opened, he was excited. He started to move his head to the side as he moved forward and to the side slightly. Standing before him was a dark figure in the doorway. He couldn't quite focus on it. The eyes seemed to smoke. A smell of black pepper filled his nose and stung his eyes. He took a step back. An arm dripping with smoke and blackness reaches out to hold the door open. Ron thinks he sees nails, but glancing where the arm was hurt, looking at the figure hurt, he fell backwards on its ass. He looked up enough to see a footstep on the grass, all the color and life left where the foot landed. He looked up to where there would be a face. A giant maw of teeth and heat greeted him. Ron woke up, sitting at the breakfast table. He had a coffee in his hand and a soldier and he had a coffee in his hand and a soldier that had been dipped in a soft boiled egg that was just in front of him. Just like his mom ate every morning. A video message from his assistant was playing. It was talking about pictures taking longer because he was waiting for the weather because they were waiting for the weather to calm down. Creasing his brow, Ron finishes the coffee and, and his soldiers. The pleasant feeling that gave him was not worth recalling making the breakfast. I think that makes sense. Like I said, sometimes when you're when you're writing, you 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 write some things and you're like, yeah, this is good, this makes sense, and then you read it back and you're like, um, the hell was I saying? <laughs> Oh, excuse me. I hope you didn't hear that. That was a burp. Uh, let's see. He decides to shower and take a day to relax. He had been working for a month without a break. Nine solid hours of work with no break or pause until the end of the day's work every day. Perhaps I need to relax a little, muttering to himself. He remembers seeing his mom do similar things when he was a kid. Every so often she would just need to check out and relax. Often watching Moonlighting or Kung Fu movie from Ron's collection of VHS, he decided to go for a hike. That night, 
dirty, and physically spent, Ron decided to skip checking messages and making a decent meal. Tonight. Tonight would be junk food and a stupid movie. He dug out a frozen pizza and dusted off a DVD of the Jackie Chan movie Super Cop. If his dreams were going to mess with him, he would just feed his brain childhood and hope it calms down. After the four soda pop and nearly all of the pizza, the movie was over. That familiar feeling of pores in his face demanding he never eat like this again got him in the shower. It had been an entire day. The nightmare of last night had not been in his head since the morning. Now, it's all he could think about. The steam in the shower, the slick shine of the tiles, everything started him thinking of the dream. The texture of the sky and the wood, the smell of the grass he was sure was part of it filled his mind. He closed his eyes, lifted his head to look up at the rain-styled shower head. A soft ding outside of the shower made him think of the ever-elusive cat. Turning his, turning his head to the shower door panel, he sees a human fig figure wreathed in shadows and smoke with prominent eyes. He jumps in place, letting out a yelp. He blinks hard, twice. The figure evaporates. The large Maine Coon cat sitting in the doorframe, looking at the spot the shadow figure had been standing in, letting out a meek meow before leaving. Ron turns off the shower, slowly drying off with the towel hanging inside. Patting his face dry before wrapping his waist, he slowly opens the door, the space is empty, no footprints in the dampness on the floor, no evidence of a person standing on the plush rug just outside of the shower, nothing in a place it should not be. Once in the kitchen with his tablet and cell phone, Ron sits the tablet up, opening the video call app, tapping on his assistant's picture. Hey Ron, has to be 11 at night for you, what's wrong? The kind face smiles. Hey, Lang, I need you to schedule a mental health appointment for me and a general physical. Nodding, Lang grabs a device and a stylus, taking notes. Should I call your mom or your agent? No. I think I may have just pushed myself a bit or coming down with the flu or one of the new COVID strains. I take it you went out looking for a fella? Lang smirks. Yeah, I went out two weekends ago to Toronto. Had company one night. Ron sighs, grabbing his seltzer water from the cooler below the table. Before you ask, I did make sure we were safe. Lang smiles as they write. Your mom would be happy to hear that. I know. So, when she asks, you can make sure she doesn't panic. I'm sure it's just nothing. Anything I should add in the notes to the doctors? Tell them my morning skip happened again. I was eating breakfast without recalling making it. Ron slams the rest of the seltzer. Lang looks into the camera. Since you asked me to do this, I'm going to ask if you've been drinking or doing any drugs. No, I'm still sober. Divorce was enough of a wake-up call for me. I was tempted to let the boys at the bar buy me drinks, but I made them buy me expensive mocktails instead. Smiling, Lang writes a few more lines. Okay, Ron. I'll have this in tonight. I'm still in New Zealand, so if you need me on site, we'll take a bit. About a day. Anything else? Nah, thanks, Lang. I'm excited to see what pictures you can get. Can you go through my emails and voice messages for the next few days? Sure, Ron. Take care of yourself. I'll call if anything important comes up. The screen goes dark, takes the light from most of the room. The cooler below the table casting a pale light in, onto the floor. Small LED dots softly, softly glowing along the baseboards making it easy to wander the house without issue. Ron yawns largely as he imagines a giant bug flying into his mouth. He laughs to himself as he walks up the stairs throwing the towel into the bathroom as he passes it. Landing face down on the bed. He drifts off to sleep before getting his entire body onto the mattress. The familiar scene fades in before Ron. The fence, the impossible to focus on house beyond it. 
He tries first to pull the stone table to the fence and meets the same limits as before. His hands can rise above, but not his head. He tries to look beyond the fence, one eye at a time. The shifting texture and color of the house are impossible to pin down. Even to decide what colors and textures that are shifting is impossible to decipher. Moving to the door of the fence by touching each picket, tapping the rail near his head with his hand, the rail near his feet with his toes. He pets the handle. He stares at the latch. He imagines what it might feel like to lick it, like he might have done when he was a kid. What if it were made of candy, like a toffee or some kind of candy cane? What if the fence was built into a wall, and that's why he was unable to open it? What if the house he saw on the other side was a projection on a translucent screen that deformed the image, and it was moving in an erratic pattern, causing it to blur? He pictured the other side, the space between the house and the fence, the grass on the ground on the other side of the fence door. He imagined the house had exposed brick with wooden shutters on the windows. He imagined the sky on the other side being a crystal blue like you saw in the movies from the 60s. He takes a deep breath as he wraps his head around the handle and presses the latch with his thumb. He pulls the door. He feels resistance. Like it is a door in a warped condition, making it an ill fit for the frame of the bottom, making it an ill fit for the frame of, or the bottom of it too low to move. The uniform resistance begins to feel as if the door itself is unwilling to move. Closing his eyes, taking a deep breath, he pulls the handle, imagining it open. Flying open, Ron falls onto his back, the handle in his hand as he sits up. He finds it difficult to move fast or even much. His head feels thick and heavy. He moves to look at the space where the door to the fence is. An absence of color, depth, and no sense of the space belonging to the rest of the scene begins to overwhelm him. His belly feels warm as his mouth gets that familiar feeling of acid and heat when having drunk too much. His feet and eyes both feel out of his control as he tries to stand, needing to work slowly at it. He notices a throbbing sound, unsure how long it's been there. The sound, like the throbbing and pulsing bass of a club, the boots and pants, boots and pants, boots and pants rhythm underlined with a deeper tone created by an unknown thud. The intensity of it made his chest vibrate, his heart struggled to beat, his lungs finding it hard to hold breath. He tries to tell himself to calm down, but the words he speaks do not feel as if they made a sound from his throat. He moves slowly to open the door, the blank space pushing at him. The sense of a great wind with no feeling of a breeze leaning into the force began to make him feel like he was in a cartoon. The ridiculous impossibility of dreams starting to come to his mind. Remembering this was a dream, he did not need to worry. This was just a dream. He moved slowly, reaching out to open the door, reaching out to the picket, making up the edge of the door. He tries to dig his fingers in the space between, trying to remind himself of the nature of the dream. He was in charge. He would simply look on the other side of the fence and get what his mind decides the house is supposed to look like in his painting. He reaches out with his other hand to grab at the space the latch locks into. Excuse me. He tries to push his fingers into the bleak empty. He can't get his fingers through the other side. He snags the post as best he can, pulling himself forward, his toes at the threshold and his nose nearly touching it, his energy and strength taxed and nearly exhausted. He rests his head on the invisible barrier. Just look, Ron, he whispers to himself. Looking back at him is nothing. Empty, cold. 
bleak. Somehow more of a void than he imagined possible. He tries to move forward again, his knees and hands pushing against the rough stone surface, his head and shoulders feeling a cold marble as they press harder. Just as his will to push starts to flicker, he thinks he sees something. He tries to focus, tries to work out the dark shape in the in the the <laughs> tries to work out the shape in the darkness. His hands work around the surface of the barrier together until he stops. His fingertips reach in slightly. Pulling at the small invisible gap, he tries to keep focus on whatever the shapes in the inky landscape are. Pulling to the sides, he feels the space in his hands are getting in his hands are getting in larger, the space between his hands widening. He begins to laugh. The strength he is using makes him feel like he is at the gym, showing off his ability to whomever wishes to objectify him that day. The satisfaction he would feel from a good day's workout and the exceptional feeling he would get from the guys he would meet doing that. A brew of ego and pride swept over him as he pulls at the opening. Getting his hands to the sides of the doorway, looking at his hands as, as he does this, seeing his fingertips vanish and reappear as they enter and exit the space. Deciding the opening is enough for him to walk through, he reaches ahead with his hands and steps forward. Ron told his family he liked boys when he was 12. They were supportive and never made him feel like he did not belong with them. At school, it was not amazing. He lost his place on the wrestling team because people thought simply being gay implied he had AIDS. The early days that mixed with how much of a joke the gay men were in popular culture made it hard for Ron to feel like he could thrive. He attended a small college and found his friends and the community he needed. While it was never easy, it got less of a hassle to be a gay man in the world. Even being able to marry the guy he thought loved him was a blessing. If only he had been faithful and didn't feel the need to abuse Ron and his trust. The past few years had been what his, what his entire life was about. Finding his unique voice in painting. Being sober and successful. Discovering that he did not need another person to feel valid and vital. The foundation of alcohol and club drugs was nothing stable enough to build upon, and he had the time to find a good partner. Someone his mom would love, and his friends could be friends with, or just someone to share pain and joy with. Ron had no idea what that future was. He just knew that his entire life was not an empty void. Not empty and cold and bleak like what he was feeling and seeing now. His compressed view of his life and what brought him to tonight kept playing in his head like a clip show episode of a sitcom. He could not feel the ground. There were no smells. It was impossible to fully see his hands and waist. Trying to make a sound was met with a similar feeling you get when trying to yell underwater. There was pressure, but not much else. Ron tried to remind himself that this was still a dream. He was not awake. This was not a bad trip. There was no pink elephant about to manifest from the fractals of hallucinatory drunkenness. This was just a dream. A weird dream that might be a result of an illness or some kind of stress. He tries to focus before himself. He tries to focus before himself. Find a center. Maybe. Maybe wake up. He blinks to see a face before him. Deep, empty eyes looking inside of his own heart. He smells the acrid breath of vomit and the stale beer of a cheap dive bar. The face has a familiar look about it. He hears a voice. It shakes his chest and head like the base of a speaker as tall as he is. The voice makes no sense. Ron feels himself being thrown back. The speed increases and the sense of movement is joined by a rough texture of coarse sand blasting his face as he continues to fall backwards. 
the inconsistent sensation starts to disorient him. He feels himself being thrown back, his feet and arms in front of him giving him a rough U-shape, the even pelting of coarse sand on his face, feet, chest, and hands start to make him feel as if he might be falling forward. Moments later, frozen rain, just short of hail, begins pelting the back of his legs, as if he is falling head first with the rain falling on his legs. Just as he tries to make sense of this, the tops of his arms and part of his head begin feeling pelting, then the tops of his legs. His mind gives up. He begins to feel numb. Then each side of his body begins to feel hot and focused wind blowing from each side, not disrupting the other forces touching his body. The intensity of it all rises quickly. The weight and roughness of the sand increases with the frozen rain that turns into excuse me, that turns into balls of hail. The hot wind from either side begins to feel what it must be like in an air fryer in his thinking. Burning hair and skin fill his nose, the feeling of being cut and bleeding all over, followed by a sense of being flayed. The skin and meat from his bones flake away, his eyelids slowly erode, his teeth begin to feel like exposed nerves. The bottoms of his feet stop hurting as he feels his groin evaporate with his tongue and lungs. The joints of his bones are picked clean of cartilage, losing the ability to remain together. His eyeless skull drifts for, from the rest of the collection of slowly ground up bones. Somehow, the skull still feels each of the textures and forces. Then, Ron becomes aware. He can't move and feels no need to take a breath. The space he takes in is gloomy, a black light making some of the table he can see glow. The walls he can make out covered in a bright white in bright white symbols. He cannot feel himself inhale, but he smells sage and musky scents mixed with the copper of blood. He looks around trying to take in all of the details, take in all of the details he can manage. A line of something appears right in his vision. His right eye has something dripping down over it. He tries to wipe his face. Nothing happens. As it drips down, a figure walks in front of the skull. The voice is disoriented at first, then it clears. It is really easy to make sure blood does not get into the eye sockets of the skull. We need him to see. Another voice rings with perfect clarity. I'm still not sure about this. You wanted him to suffer? This will make him suffer. Did, did, did we have to kill that boy? How the fuck do you think this kind of magic works? Ron sees the world move as his hand as a hand covers his vision. He sees two fingers enter his eye range. The world moves with shakes and swings until the fingers pull back and he is looking at his ex husband. Gaunt. Strung out. Covered in what Ron imagines is blood markings. His hair matted with some with something. As another figure walks into view, nude and covered in similar markings and similar state of hair. Ron tries to scream at his ex. Frank was never what one would call stable. It took Ron a while to see that. Frank said he was a functional drunk, but he left out the heroin and LSD that he consumed in massive quantities when he would do rituals with his group. In the courtroom, Frank explained that his religion was an offshoot of the Golden Dawn and the true demonic worshipping mankind had been doing since they walked from the caves. The occult expert testified that Frank and his friends were delusional and had put together actual occult history with fantasy and tried to justify violence and drug use by claiming similarities to satanic, wicked, and voodoo practices while only mimicking the more ill-informed aspects of those from movies. Frank stood in front of the skull. How will we know if it worked? Listen, ye of little face, I use spells to get you out, right? Ye yes, I guess. You guess? The other figure rushes up next to Frank. You fucking guess? Did I spend a month stalking that boy to make sure he, we could use him for this rape for something that would never work? 
Did I kill that homeless guy for his lungs for kicks? Sitting down, looking into Ron's gaze. No, I just want to get this over with. Fine. We will know he is in the skull when... What is it? Frank looking to the other man. He's in there. The other man sits next to Frank in front of the skull. Hi, Ron. I'm Jake. Ron thinks to himself, wake up, wake up, wake up. As if Jake and Frank heard him, they both peer closer. We can hear you, Ron, they both say. Jake sits back looking at Frank. Frank situates himself to sit as straight as he can. Okay, Ron, here it is. I want you to kill yourself tonight. Jake's face frowns deeply. You must go into more detail than that. He must know your grievance. Then you tell him how he will kill himself. Okay, Frank says. I loved you, Ron. Just because I made a few mistakes, you left me. I would have done anything for you. You didn't need to be afraid of me. Frank stops mouthing words. The world gets dark for Ron slightly. Jake hands Frank a bowl, telling him to drink. Dark red runs down Frank's chin. I, he continues, I, well, I need to be free from you before I can rejoin the coven. Jake puts his hand on Frank's back. Inside of Ron's mind, he screams. This was a nightmare. Why would he dream this, he kept thinking. Jake looks to Ron. You will never, you will never fully wake up from this, Ron. The last thing you will see is Frank and I generating the energy required to make you obey his commands. And then your essence will be bound to us until we use you for whatever task we, we require. Frank clears his throat. Ron, you will consume your entire supply of pain management medication. If you do not have any of that, you will drink bleach. Jake moves, moves to fill Ron's range of vision. You will die tonight, you fucker. He backs up and begins to kiss Frank. They stand, both in the state of excitement. Ron does his best to shut his vision off as they continue to enact the generation of energy. As they both enter a state of physical bliss, the entire scene washes in white before going entirely black. Ron wakes in his bed, covered with a thin layer of dampness. His fingertips and back feel like they fell asleep. The pens and needles feeling in his fingers match his back. He tries to make sense of the nightmare he had. Why would he have such a dark and violent dream of Frank? Why would he... Stopping himself thinking, he feels a need to search his medicine collection. Then... Every single method he had picked up to stay sober came to mind. Ron runs to his tablet, pulls up his assistance icon. The screen lights up. Hey, boss, just give me a second to wake up. I think it's just past midnight here. Lang, find out if Frank is still in the facility, Ron blurts out. Oh, I, uh, I can answer that now. He was released to the custody of a private firm that was paid for by uh, his family, Lang says, adjusting the frame. In their own face. He doesn't have any family that want anything to do with him, Lang. What's the name on the paperwork? Um, your lawyer sent the document the other day. And I filed it in your need to review folder. I didn't expect his moving to another facility to really matter. Ron sighs. It shouldn't, but I need to know right now. Uh, here it is, Lang mumbles a bit before saying, Ah, yes. The Chaldean Sunrise Medical Center. Head doctor is someone named Jake Roach. Call the police and have them check on Frank and ask my lawyer to look into Jake. Uh, sure thing, Lang pauses. Hey, can I send someone out to you? You probably should, Ron said before crying. Hey, I, it's okay. I'll arrange for the local team to head out for you right now. I'll book my flight. I'll be there tomorrow afternoon, I think, at the latest. Thanks, Lang. I have to go. Before Lang can reply, Ron turns off the tablet and throws it across the room, screaming behind it. He runs to the medicine box, then rushes to... to... to the... you know, I didn't put... 
D grinder. Um, he uses he, then he rushes to the grinder he uses for composting, dropping everything into the machine. He begins to sweat. He second guesses his action, starts to reach into the machine, pulling his hand out just before knowing it would get ground up. It's excuse me. Then he feels thirsty. The dryness in his throat was more profound than anything he has ever felt. The ability to breathe properly feels beyond him. Every shot, every short breath feels like nails running down inside his neck. He finds himself in the kitchen, searching for something to drink under the sink. He opens the glass cleaner, throwing it to the floor. He does the same with the soap and the tile cleaner. He finds a full bottle of drain cleaner, open it, smell it, and then turns it upside down into the drain. Rushing to the laundry room, he pours all of the soap and softener into the washer, turning it on. He finds a spray bottle of starch and one of a bleach alternative, throwing them out of the window. He starts to rub dryer sheets on his face as his eyes react to the chemicals and puff up slightly. Now crawling, he finds powdered cleaner in the bathroom, dumps that in the toilet, crawls to the upstairs bathroom, screaming at himself as he tears the top off the spray cleaner, throwing it into the tub. He starts to crawl down the stairs, slipping on an assortment of chemicals and soaps on his arms and hands, sliding down to the floor, knocking his head. Standing with support from the wall, he makes his way to his painting studio. He finds the paint thinner. He opens it. The smell burns his nose and stings his eyes. The blurred vision he has turns attention to the unfinished painting. The nearly covered fence leaves the neatly covered fence leaves the partially painted and sketched background exposed. A fury and pain scream inside Ron as he empties the paint thinner onto the floor. An air quality alarm in the house and in the workshop go off. The shrill sound makes Frank drop the canister. <clears throat> the fumes around him overwhelm him and he falls to the floor. Just as he thinks he needs to lick the floor, he is picked up and a mask put over his nose and mouth. The next hour is a daze, as the team hovering over him keep repeating that he will be fine and he needs to stay awake. They draw blood, wash him off, and secure him to a hospital bed. He falls asleep after a while when the doctor comes in saying he needs to be sedated. When he wakes up, he's unable to move his arms very much off the bed, and his legs are strapped down. He feels a button in his right hand. Pressing it makes a soft buzz. A TV controller at his left, at his left hand, left, bleh, his left hand's fingertips. <sighs> he turns it on just to check the time and date. It's just the next day, late in the afternoon. He sighs in relief. The door opens with a pouring of nurses and two doctors. After every device is checked, the room clears and one doctor is left. Okay, Ron. How are you? What happened? Ron feels his throat is a bit dry and takes note of a tub at tube in his nose. You've had a rather intense episode we think is related to PTSD, anxiety, maybe something else going on. We're not sure what set it off, so we're keeping you secured until we're sure you're not going to harm yourself. Ron smiles. Yeah, I get it. I've been having some intense dreams and memories recently. Okay, well, your assistant said you were worried about your ex-husband having been transferred to a new facility. Is this what pushed you to your episode? Honestly, I don't remember knowing about it until after I started having problems. I just remember asking my assistant, and everything went weird. The doctor scratches a few notes. Yes, well, the timing tells me you were having trouble, and finding out about your ex was the final trigger. We'll need to observe you overnight, just before we can discharge you. Yeah, that that's cool. Can I have a soda water? The doctor nods before walking out. Ron hears him tell a nurse to get a Coke and plastic cup and straw. 
Next few hours was a tedious slog of cognitive tests and mental health interviews. He was appraised of all test results and confirmed by two doctors that he likely had an intense panic attack. The main concern was that Ron might be dangerous to himself, but since this was an since this was isolated and he had a support structure, he would be released the following morning. Ron was told his assistant was in the hospital. He asked to have his assistant hire a cleaning team for the house and to secure a place for them to stay for a week. The following morning, he was wheeled out with Lang next to him, waving down, <clears throat> waving down a car, waving down the car they hired. So, uh, I ordered burgers and milkshakes and have some Mexican dish I can't pronounce properly for dinner tonight. And your mom wants to have a video call in about three hours. Thanks, Lang, Ron says. Sorry you had to leave New Zealand. No worries. You'll pay to send me back. Only got a fourth of the pictures you wanted. At the hotel in Toronto, Ron felt confined. It wasn't that it was small. It was the streets that were narrow, the buildings that were too close. He had grown accustomed to seeing miles of open space, not the chaos of sound and shadow that the city served. The video call with his mom also was not helping. Are you drinking or doing lines off butts? She said in a way that only mothers can. Mom, what in the hell? Ron exclaimed as Lang stifled a laugh out of range of the camera. Well, I saw it in a movie, and, Mom, not all gay men are like those caricatures of humans in those movies. I told you not to watch that trashy stuff. Oh, well, my friend said it was a good movie. It had that Christian Bale fella, and I swear the main guy was David Bowie. Mom, you're not helping me relax right now. Oh, shit, I'm sorry, son. She blushes and sighs. I heard about Frank, and I wish it didn't have that effect on you. Ron sighs, glances to Lang, giving him a hand signal that said, Get me out of this, please. Mom, I'm fine. Frank being out of a facility that had security rating was a comfort. Now his being at this hippie bullshit. Ron, your doctor is calling about some tests he wants to go over, Lang says clearly from off camera. Frowning, Ron's mom sticks out her tongue. Well, call me later, I suppose. Your mom still loves you, and I would be thrilled if you came to visit. Uh, if I could stay in Quebec, I would, Mom. Possibly fly you out here next month? She nods. Love you, son. Love you, Mom. The screen goes dark, and Ron and Lang laugh. That night, Lang is in a video conference explaining pronouns to their dad again, while their sister and mom tried and failed to maintain the proper pronouns themselves. Ron thought it was sweet that they had a weekly family chat. Lang was always focused on keeping the parents and sister as close as possible. Ron liked that. When the video chat was done, Lang made sure Ron didn't need anything else before going to the adjacent room. Ron spread out on the bed. The slight burn in his sinus cavity from the chemicals he exposed himself to made it impossible to smell the mole he had. It also masked the smell of his scented oils and lotions. He knew his brain could sense it. Might as well just relax, he thought. His eyes were nearly closed when a knock at the door got him up. He checked the time. 10 p.m. He had not ordered anything, and Lang was likely wearing earplugs by now. He ignored it. The next knock echoed in his head. He sat up. What? he shouted. We have a package from the hospital for you, sir. The voice was soft and muffled through the thick door. Leave it at the front desk and I'll get it in the morning, he yells back. Sorry, they said it was time sensitive. Ron sighed. He had no idea what it could be, but he knew the doctors were likely ordered by him, by his mom, to do something. Fine, he yells, getting up. Through the peephole, he sees a guy that is likely one of the night desk people. A bit rougher than the other staff, but still a decent-looking guy. Okay, thanks. I'll get it, he says at the door. You just have to sign, sir. Ron rolls his eyes. Why in the fuck? He opens the door and is immediately rushed by two people. 
One of them covers Ron's mouth with a thick fold of fabric sitting on his arms and waist. The other closes the door quickly, then starts to turn off the lights. As he walks around the room to do this, Ron sees it's Frank. He focuses on the man on top of him, and he thinks it's Jake. He tries to yell through the layers over his mouth, quickly feeling lightheaded. Shh, Ron, Jake says. You were just in the hospital, and you're already short of oxygen, it seems. Just relax, and this will all be over before you know it. Frank kneels next to them. Ron, you, you didn't do what we asked, so we're here to make sure you die. The pale look in Frank's face and how deeply set his eyes were told Ron everything he needed to know. He was amped on meth and was possibly mainlining it. Ron remembered loving Frank and wanting to help, but not right now. This was this Jake. He was in charge, and he was not going to let Frank get distracted. Jake moved his head to the side. Frank, the pouch inside is a, the, the pouch. Inside is a needle, and that ampule, that special mix we got from the shop. Ron's eyes asked why, and Jake seemed to read his mind. We're going to give you the zombie drug, and it's laced with fentanyl and LSD. As you die, we're going to bind you to Frank's charm, and then you'll be ours to use. Ron tries to struggle and fight. Jake had to have a good 60 pounds on him and how he had Ron pinned made movement very impossible. Frank begins to pause with every move. He's unable to not shake, and he keeps missing putting the needle into the bottle to fill the syringe. Jake sighs as his face grows red. Frank, babe, just breathe and relax. Just like that last one, we are binding the soul. Your Ron is going to be living in your charm. Remember talking to that boy as we told him what to do to get Ron here into that to get Ron here into that skull? Frank nods. He takes a deep breath, planting the needle in the bottle, then fills the syringe. He holds it up, flicks it a few times, pushing the air out. He looks down to Ron. Ron's eyes, now filled with tears, try to express a plea for compassion from Frank. With his free hand, Frank pets Ron's head. I, I love you, but you tried to destroy me, so I'll have to bind you to my will. Frank closes his eyes, taking a breath in. He opens his eyes, leans, leans over to aim the needle at Ron's neck. Just as this happens, the connecting door to Lang's room opens with Lang holding his laptop saying, I just got a call from the police to your phone and... Frank jabs the needle forward. Jake howls, raising his hand with the needle sticking inside of it. Frank falling backwards, crying, holding his hands up to his head. Ron rolls over, grabbing his shoes as, shoes as the only close thing, begins smacking Jake in the face over and over. Lang drops his laptop, tackling Jake off Ron entirely. Jake starts to froth at the mouth, then goes still. Frank rolls up into a ball, chanting nonsense. Not long after, the police were escorting Frank out of the room in cuffs, and the EMTs were finalizing the preliminary report to the police. Lang was side-hugging Ron. The next morning, Ron knew what color the house was and the texture of the walls. He scribbled the notes on a loose sheet of paper, handing it to Lang. Lang looks at the scrap of paper. You sure? Ron nods. That weekend, Lang burns the picture of the fence. There we go. I, um, that was bleak and dark, but I, yeah, like I said, I asked what genre I should write, and I was told to write horror, so I was really trying to keep in that vein. Um, the Ron character, like, I myself am still in recovery. I've had a number of abusive relationships, and um, 
you know, I can kind of relate to Ron in a lot of ways. And I have some really dark dreams sometimes. Um, so, you know, I'm probably processing a bunch of stuff here. But, but, I'm also nothing like Ron. <laughs> and as far as I know, nobody I've been with is anything like Frank. But, you know... It was a story, and I, I really like it. There were a few parts where I was especially confused what I was actually writing and trying to say, but um, I think the overall like story, uh, the character um, uh, uh, journey that we experience with Ron, um, I thought it was good, and I hope you enjoyed it. Really, I do. Um, that was Picture of Fences, and uh, like and subscribe, and don't forget Non-Binary Spectre Monotile Pattern Journal. It's hardcover. Yeah, and look, it's bigger than my head. So you can fit all those notes in there, and each page is dots. There's 200 pages in there, and also don't forget the coloring books, Mindful and Funky. There's three of them right now. As I understand it, there's a fourth one that we're going to get doing soon. And uh, Red Bubble Zazzle, designed by humans, all nails that glow. My website, nailsthatglow.com. Also check out my podcast, Abstractions That Glow. That has been irregular, but I'm going to start doing it on a weekly basis. And I have some guests lined up. So that'll be pretty exciting. Um, I can't really think of anything else, so I'll just say thank you so much for joining me today for First Drafts That Glow. Please come back next week. If you have any suggestions for genre, random words uh, for me to use in uh, a story, you know, put it in the comments below. Be sure to share, you know, tell your friends. And um, don't forget, this is also an audio podcast. And if you're listening to the audio podcast, this is also a video. Uh, first draft, set glow. You know, you can find it pretty much anywhere. And all those links are on my website as well, nailsetglow.com.